Okay, let's get into this. We're doing a bit of a deep dive today on a specific ship one spotted working the rivers over in Vietnam. Right, it's quite interesting actually. We've got this article focusing just on this one vessel on the Long Tao River. A really vital route. Exactly. And it gives us a chance to, you know, understand the story behind one of these workhorses of trade. Yeah, our goal here is basically to figure out why this ship, which is uh, getting on a bit in years, is still so important over there. Let's talk about it then. The TS Challenge. TS Challenge. Sounds about right for an older vessel. Well, yeah, it's a bulk carrier, nearly 30 years old now, built back in 96. Wow, 1996. And it's still running that key Long Tao River route, the one connecting the East Sea right into Ho Chi Minh City. That's a major commercial waterway, right? Oh, absolutely. Critical. And this isn't some tiny riverboat we're talking about. It's uh, 167 meters long. Yep, 167 meters long, 27 wide. Capacity is nearly 28,500 tons when fully loaded. It's a substantial vessel. That's definitely seen some miles then. You can probably tell just by looking at it. You can. The article points out um, a really heavily rusted deck. Sort of a visual badge of honor, maybe? Or just wear and tear. Huh, maybe. A sign of constant work against the sea and the weather. Definitely. But what's really interesting, despite the age, yeah. it's got these four big hydraulic cranes midship. Okay, what do they do? It means it can load and unload itself. It doesn't need the port to have cranes ready. Ah, self-sufficient. That must be super useful on river roads where maybe not every dock is fully equipped. Exactly. That self-loading capability is key. Makes it way more flexible, lets it go to more places. And it's flying a Panama flag, the article says, but it's always seen on this Vietnamese river. Yeah, that's pretty common in shipping. The flag doesn't always tell you where it operates. The TS logo, though. What about that? Could be Tussauds Shipping, or maybe TS Line. They're based out of Taiwan or Hong Kong, typically. Mm. Gives you a hint of the ownership or management structure. Just shows how globalized shipping is, even for a ship working a specific domestic route. Totally. Ships change hands, change flags, change operators all the time throughout their lives. And this one is definitely still earning its keep. It's regularly traveling the Suai Rock Long Tail Route. Uh huh. Carrying essential stuff, bulk cargo like um, cement, clinker, or wheat. The real basic building blocks for the economy. Precisely. Getting them to the big ports nearby, like Kat Lai and Hip Book. Think construction, industry, food. So it's plugging away, doing vital work. The article also mentions it discharging ballast water. Why bring that up? Is that unusual? Oh no, not unusual at all. It's standard procedure. Ships take on water, ballast water, for stability when they're empty or lightly loaded. Right, to keep it balanced. Exactly. So when they load cargo, or before docking sometimes, they need to pump some of that water out to maintain the right trim and stability. It's fundamental for safety. Okay, standard practice. Standard, but also, you know, regulated. Because discharging water from one place into another can potentially move marine species around. So it's managed. Gotcha. So back to the age thing. This is the big question, isn't it? Why is a ship from 1996 still doing this critical work? Why not get a newer one? And that really comes down to, well, money. Economics. Cost effectiveness. That's what the article suggests, yeah. Yeah. An older ship, if it's been well maintained. Right, maintenance is key. It can still be really efficient for certain jobs. And the big thing is the investment cost is way, way lower than buying a new ship. Makes sense. Especially for these like domestic river routes. Maybe the profit margins aren't enormous, so using a reliable, paid off older asset is just good business. That's the calculation they're likely making. You trade off having the absolute latest tech for lower capital costs. If it does the job reliably and the upkeep isn't excessive yet. It keeps working. It keeps working. These ships can have surprisingly long working lives if they're looked after and the economics still stack up for the routes they serve. Okay, so wrapping this up, our look at the TS Challenge really shows that old doesn't mean obsolete in shipping. Not at all. This nearly 30 year old vessel is um, a practical cost effective workhorse for moving essential goods where they need to go in Vietnam. A vital piece of the puzzle. Definitely. And it kind of makes you think, doesn't it, about how often we might just write off older things, machines, systems, whatever, just because there's something newer out there. Hmm. Overlooking the value that's still there. Yeah. Makes you wonder what other old faithfuls are quietly keeping things running, you know, behind the scenes in all sorts of areas. Okay, imagine this for a second. You're standing by the Long Tao River, and you see this uh, 
absolutely massive steel container ship just gliding past, silent. Yeah, quite a sight. And the interesting thing, really, is that ship, the HIN time, it's not some global freighter from Rotterdam or Shanghai. Exactly. That's the key point. It's a core part of Vietnam's own domestic shipping network. Right. So forget those huge international vessels for a moment. This one, the HIN time, it belongs to HIN lines. They're a major player in Vietnamese um, inland sea transport. A real workhorse. And we're talking substantial size here. Our sources say 132.6 meters long, nearly 20 meters wide. That's big. It is. And it can carry, what, almost 700 TEU containers. But the crucial thing is its design. It's built for those coastal routes and to get into these, you know, important inland ports. It brings us right to the Long Tao River. It's like a vital artery, isn't it? Absolutely. It's the main water route linking Ho Chi Minh City out to the East Sea. But the information we look at, it makes it clear this isn't just a wide, easy channel. Oh, definitely not. For a ship that size, it presents some real navigational um, challenges. Like what specifically? Well, the sources really detail the kind of precision needed. Following pilot instructions has to be absolutely strict. Yeah. You need to maintain a really steady speed, navigate these quite sharp bends very carefully. Grounding is a constant risk. Wow. It's fascinating to think about the skill involved there. It's not just about the ship's power, it's this intricate sort of dance in a pretty tight space. Exactly, it's choreography, like you said. And what's also interesting is just the sheer volume of goods moving this way domestically. Right. The reports we analyzed show a really significant and growing reliance on this kind of inland sea transport within Vietnam. It connects the different economic hubs. So it raises questions about maybe the efficiency and how adaptable these networks are. It does. It's a critical piece of their infrastructure. Okay, so let's just sort of crystallize this. The HA and time making these regular trips on a long tail. It really highlights this uh, often unseen but totally essential role of domestic shipping. Mm -hmm. While we all focus on the giant international routes, these inland connections, they're really the backbone of a country's internal trade flow. Yeah, moving the goods within the country. And if you zoom out a bit, the Any Shrine Time is just one example. You've got countless similar operations happening all over the world. Quietly making sure things get where they need to go. Precisely. Through these complex, often quite demanding logistical chains that most of us never see. So for you listening, maybe the next time you, I don't know, pick up a product, just take a second to think about the journey it might have taken. Yeah. The AG on Time carefully navigating the bends of the Long Tao River. It's a great snapshot of that whole intricate web of domestic shipping that, well, underpins our everyday lives. It really makes you wonder, doesn't it, what other kinds of vital logistical networks are humming away right now, pretty much unnoticed. Hmm. All silently facilitating the movement of goods we just take for granted. That's definitely something to maybe explore a bit more on your own. You ever feel like you're just skimming the surface, even with all the news flying around? Absolutely. It's easy to miss the details. Well, that's what we're trying to fix here. Quickly, okay. today uh, we're diving into one specific ship, the Juan HAI 289. Ah, yes. And it's not just any old container ship, is it? This one has a pretty unique story, especially concerning a particular river. Exactly. It's making waves, you could say. We've got some interesting source info here about its size, its capabilities, where it goes. And importantly, its environmental impact. Yeah. How it interacts with the place it sails through. Right. So our mission, if you will, is to figure out what this single ship tells us about, well, the huge world of global trade and how it affects things locally. Okay, so let's start with the scale because it's genuinely impressive. Yeah. The one HAI 289 is almost 200 meters long. Almost 200 meters, that's huge especially when you think about it navigating a narrow river. Precisely. The exact numbers are 199.9 meters in length, and it's about 32.2 meters wide. A real giant for these waterways. And what it carries, wow, up to 2,646 TEU containers. TEU, meaning 20-foot equivalent unit. So yeah, the standard shipping container size, we're talking thousands of tons of goods, potentially. Thousands. And it's built for performance, too, right? Something about the design. That's right. It has features like a bulbous bow that sort of rounded protrusion at the front below the waterline. Oh, okay. It helps reduce water resistance, makes it more fuel efficient. And it's designed for a speed of about 21 knots. 21 knots, which is pretty quick for a ship this size, keeping it on schedule. Crucial for logistics. And it's scheduled busy. It's a regular on the Vietnam Rus Cat Lai near Ho Chi Minh City. 
Haiphong up north, Da Nang. So it's a really key link for Vietnam's supply chain. Definitely. Connecting Vietnam with places like China, Singapore, Japan, major trading partners. But that journey, especially up the Long Tao River you mentioned, the sources say it's quite a challenge. It really is. We even described it narrow, lots of curves, and the current that they have. So muddy water. Yeah, which you can expect handling. Imagine steering this massive ship nearly 200 meters long through tight bends. The sources even mention it has to sort of tilt or lean into the turns. Wow, that takes serious skill from the crew. Absolutely, experienced hands needed for sure. And it's not just about getting through. The ship itself has a physical impact, doesn't it? It does. There's this phrase, Song Tao Danbo, ship waves hitting the shore. Ship waves hitting the shore, okay. And these aren't small ripples. The waves from a hole this size are powerful. They're causing erosion along the banks, apparently even knocking down trees sometimes. So a direct environmental effect right there. A very visible one. It's a reminder, isn't it? These ships are essential for trade, but they do interact physically with their environment. And inside those thousands of containers, what kind of stuff are we talking about? Pretty much everything. The sources mentioned phones, machinery, food items, electronic components. <laughs> Or work. This is where it gets personal for you, the listener. If you're in, say, Hanoi or Ho Chi Minh City, that phone you bought, the fridge in your kitchen. It's entirely possible, maybe even likely, that some parts, or the whole thing, traveled on this exact ship, the one Haijai 289. It really brings home how connected we are through these logistics networks. It does. This one ship dealing with tricky navigation, leaving its mark on the riverbanks. Yeah. It's a vital piece in that huge global puzzle. So looking at the Wan Hai Cho 89 gives us this um, fascinating window into the sheer scale of global trade, yes, but also it's very real, tangible impacts from the goods you use every day. The effects on a local river ecosystem in Vietnam connects the global to the very local. Right, so the big takeaway is how this single vessel story reflects so much more. Exactly, and maybe it leaves you thinking, and how many other ships like this are out there? Constantly moving, unseen by most of them. Silently powering the world economy. Yeah. What are all the ripple effects, economic and environmental, that we don't even often consider? It's quite something to ponder, all sparked by this one ship's journey.